So we're reading this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. And as I said, this is a very familiar part of the Christmas story for all of us. So listen anew to these words of God to us. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Galilee was an ordinary and unimportant town. And Mary is about to be married to a man who is an ordinary day laborer. We find out later on that Joseph is a carpenter. In other words, in the eyes of the world, there is nothing really that special about this young woman, Mary. And he, Gabriel, came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed or troubled, disturbed, alarmed, whatever your translation may say. She was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. Now our English rendering of this verse, in my opinion, is severely lacking because what the Greek verb implies is that Mary is beyond her limits. She has stirred up in a way that is distressing or acutely alarming. She is experiencing a total inner commotion like a troubled sea churning inside of her. And then we read that she pondered and in our modern day use of this word, that sounds like she's sitting in a comfortable easy chair looking out over some beautiful scenery. But in the original context, this verb means that she is going back and forth trying to evaluate something in her mind and usually that leads to a confused conclusion. It's like one confused mind talking to another confused mind and all that does is reinforce the original confusion. This is the verb that is used when the disciples are arguing amongst themselves about who is going to be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. It's also the verb that's used when the Pharisees argue amongst themselves and question the authority by which Jesus is healing the paralytic. In all of these cases, their confusion misses the much, much, much bigger picture. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Now, if you Google images of the Annunciation, which is the name we give this story of the angel Gabriel visiting Mary, you'll be hard pressed to find any that show fear on Mary's face. She may have her hands up like this as if she's about to bat off an incoming pillow in a pillow fight. But she always has this somewhat passive look on her face. Now, I've never been visited by an angel, or at least I don't think I have. But I have to believe they have a certain level of emotional intelligence. They are God's messengers, after all. And so Gabriel must sense Mary's fear. Gabriel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you will name him Jesus. And he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? How can this be? Maybe this angel has the wrong Mary. After all, she is really nobody in her own mind and not with any social status. So how Exactly is this going to happen when she isn't even married to Joseph yet? The angel said to her, 
The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy, and he will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. I'm wondering, have you ever paused to ask, what if Mary had never been able to become unparalyzed from her fear? What if Mary had just said, no way, you've got the wrong girl here? How is it that Mary was able to move from this state of fear to one of being able to say, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Well, I think if we go back and look at how Gabriel deals with her fear, we may find signs of the way God may deal with our fears. First, Gabriel tells her not to be afraid. And I imagine that this is in a very calm and reassuring voice. And then Gabriel tells her twice that she has found favor with God. He tells her in no uncertain terms, God knows you and God is with you. And then he paints the big picture for Mary a picture of how the plan for her life is part of a plan that God has had in place all the way through her ancestors and on into the future. And if she needs some practical answers, he tells her exactly how it is that she's going to become pregnant. And finally, if Mary needs any other proof, Gabriel says, just look at your cousin Elizabeth. She is pregnant. Now Mary would have known that Elizabeth had never been able to bear children. And she also would have known that Elizabeth was way beyond her years in terms of even being able to conceive a child. And yet here was Elizabeth also pregnant. Perhaps her older cousin could even mentor this young woman. And finally, in a last declaration, Gabriel says to Mary, nothing will be impossible with God. So defenses down, fears set aside, Mary is able to say, here I am. Now we often hear this as an old fashioned word, behold, which is an imperative and it means look, see, look at me. And as I hear Mary saying these words, I think on the one hand what she's saying is here I am, look at me, look at what God is about to do through me. And on the other hand, I hear them as a very quiet voice saying here I am as she senses with amazement what God is about to do through her. Either way, this is an act of agency. It's an expression of total faith in God and a willingness to be open to God's presence in her life. Here I am, a servant of the Lord, Mary says. Now this is not an unwilling or forced servitude because God has favored Mary, which means he has chosen her and given her gifts for a specific task. She can look at her cousin Elizabeth and know that God's word is trustworthy. And she realizes that she belongs 
She has a sense of belonging not just to God, but through a vast network of both ancient and future relationships. Here I am, Mary says, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. She freely and joyfully agrees to participate in God's larger plan for the world. She says, okay, let's do this thing. Let everything you say about me come true. Mary's life has a purpose. With God, nothing is impossible. Mary has found hope. And what she discovers is that hope is going to be born in her, both literally and figuratively. So how do we allow hope to be born in us? Mary gives us some clues. First, by choosing to be open to God. By knowing that we belong to God and by agreeing to participate in God's work in the world. Here I am, agency, a servant of the Lord, belonging. Let it be with me according to your word, purpose. Agency, belonging, and purpose are the gifts that God gives to Mary and that God offers to us. Now I'd like to tell you the story of another child that was born on Christmas Eve. Her name was Sydney and she was born to a dear friend of mine. Sydney was born with a heart defect called transformational or transposition of the great vessels of the heart. In other words, her heart was formed backwards. Now it just so happened that the very first time surgery was performed to correct this defect was done in the very hospital where Sydney was born. And that very same surgeon performed surgery on Sydney immediately after she was born. There were not many hospitals in the country at that time that had ever even attempted this surgery. And so, Leslie and her husband held hope. Sydney was normal cognitively and she had normal motor functions, but she was missing the part of her brain called the cerebellum, which is the part of our brain that controls our autonomal, autonomal nervous system, meaning those things like our blinking and our swallowing and our breathing. Now Sydney could blink, and she could swallow, but the breathing center of her brain was missing, which meant she would never be able to breathe on her own. And it took the doctors a month to do all the diagnostics to figure this out. So 32 days after she was born, Sydney was taken off of life support, and she should have died within minutes. But for nine hours, Leslie and Matt held her and they bathed her and they changed her and they loved her until she died peacefully in Leslie's arms. Now what Leslie will say is that, that during Sydney's entire short life, she taught them many lessons and she enabled them to deepen their relationship with Christ. For the next 20 years, Leslie and Matt went back to that same hospital every Christmas Eve. They prepared a dinner of lasagna and homemade rolls and fruit and salad and homemade cookies. And they served between 75 and 125 people who were camped out at the hospital because they had family members who were in the neonatal intensive care unit the pediatric intensive care unit, or the cardiac intensive care unit. They brought hope to all of these families. Now it turns out that Sydney's 
disorder was not a fluke. They discovered that it was an autosomal recessive disorder. And what that means is that while any of us have a one in 10,000 chance of carrying this genetic disorder, Leslie and her husband both carried it, which meant that any child they had would have a one in four chance of having a similar outcome. And I remember talking to Leslie, and after she was explaining all of this to me, she said, how will I ever know if I can have hope enough to have another child? When and if will that happen? Now, I don't claim to be a prophet, but on a rare occasion, I feel like I do have words given to me. And I remember the words I said to Leslie were that when hope begins to smooth out the rough edges of your grief and your fear, then you will know. Two years later, when Leslie was pregnant again, I remember telling her that I thought she was one of the bravest, most faith-filled and hopeful people I had ever met. And she gave birth to another daughter, who is now a beautiful young woman. I remembered this story when I received Leslie's Christmas card just a few weeks ago. Like many people, it was a picture of her family with three generations. And in that picture was a picture of her granddaughter, also named Sydney. This is a family whose lives have been transformed by hope and who have transformed the lives of others by serving up hope. Now let me suggest that while none of us, I expect, are about to give birth to the Son of God, we can certainly follow in Mary's footsteps. And many of us may not face the same types of hard decisions that Leslie and Matt had to entrust with God, we also can serve up hope. It's very easy to look around our world today and despair. We too, like Mary, might be troubled or confused, alarmed and doubtful, and we may even have a fear of hope. Because hope is a vulnerable place. It can feel really risky. We may fear that if we give in to hope, that we may be disappointed. Like Mary, we might ask incredulously, how can this possibly be? So we hold back on hope. How do we, like Mary, travel from fear to hope. Mary teaches us that hope is not arrived at by reason. It is an act of faith. It's believing that God's word to us is trustworthy despite our doubts and our fears and our uncertainties because God is trustworthy. This is captured so perfectly in a poem that I love by Madeline Lengel called After Annunciation. This is the irrational season when love blooms bright and wild. If Mary had been filled with reason, there would have been no room for the child. Hope is a certain posture towards life. It's a willingness to lessen our ego boundaries and to open ourselves up fully and present and be present to God. Hope is born in us when we say, here I am. Now Mary certainly didn't feel like she was anything special. She may have even felt like she was less than others. She was vulnerable, she was from a patriarchal society, engaged to a man she barely knew, and she was from a backwater town of Galilee. Yet she heard the words all of us long to hear. You are special. 
You are a favored child of God. You belong to God. And we respond when we offer our lives in service to God, when we are willing to say, here I am, a servant of the Lord. Hope grows in us by dedicating ourselves to be part of God's bigger picture. If you doubt this, just do a simple act of service for someone else and see what happens. Or look around you and see, take encouragement from others. Our world is filled with people like Leslie and Matt who have faced fear and tragedy and have dedicated their lives to serve others and to be servants of hope. So how will you serve up hope? Hope is born in us when we say, like Mary, here I am, a servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Follow Mary's lead. Open yourself to God's presence. Know that you belong to God and participate in God's work in this world. Now, a final word. Hope requires waiting. Hope has a gestational period. So during this time of Advent, we wait. We wait for God to do what only God can do for us, in us and among us. So on this final Sunday of Advent, we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Let your hope be born in us today. Amen.